to the current care guidelines. I will explain in a minute what the current care guidelines are about. But the main point is that in the most recent Finnish guidelines to reduce uh, harm from drinking alcoholic beverages, we have three levels of risks, risk indicated for the people and different, uh, different message for men and women. There is um, a level which is termed no likely risk, which is in practice it's the same as low risk. Uh, and there, that level is risk where probably there will be no harm for a healthy working age person if they stay at that level of average consumption. Then there is a level of moderate risk where changes in the liver are already possible, which means that there may be objectively detectable changes in the, in, in the person's body. And then there is a high risk level where significant increase in, in the morbidity and risk of death takes place already. So the high risk level is a kind of an alert level for the health professionals to, to advise people if they have not done that earlier. And uh, the current care guidelines in which these three levels are presented are independent evidence-based clinical practice guidelines on health medical treatment and prevention of diseases. They are a common national basis for treatment decisions taken by physicians and other healthcare professionals. And there's always a shorter version for patients because the, uh, the, the current care guidelines are quite long and there's normally a long list of uh, uh, literature at the end and sometimes there are evidence reviews for key points, separate attachments to the guidelines. There are currently 103 guidelines and both the doctor's version and the patient version are available online. They are developed by the Finnish Medical Society Duo Dekim in partnership with the Medical Specialist Societies. For example, the Society for Addiction Medicine was involved in the current care guidelines on the treatment of alcohol use disorders. So the Duo Dekim has practically all Finnish doctors as members, whereas the group of physicians dealing with alcohol and drug problems is much smaller in a small country, around 200 people. And uh, here is the guidelines process, how they do that. There is first a systematic literature search by an information specialist. Then they set up working group of volunteer experts who work in cooperation with current care editors who are kind of professionals on how to put together a fact sheets and present it. The number of volunteers participating in this exercise is total is, is 1,400 because we have these 100 plus guidelines which need to be revised every now and then to take into account new evidence. Be, the guidelines are compiled and then they are circulated to interest groups for consideration and edited as appropriate before they are being published. And the guidelines on the treatment of alcohol use disorders were first issued, I'm not sure if I found when, yeah, 2005, so they're quite recent. And they have been upda updated already three times. The latest update was last year. And that's when the three levels were added. There was only one risk level before. There was only the high risk level before. But the low risk and the medium level were added. The, the low risk level, which is termed no probable risk level by the doctors, comes from the Finnish nutrition recommendations uh, that were updated in 2014. In the Finnish nutrition recommendations, alcohol is included among the foodstuffs, the use of which should be reduced if you want to have a healthy diet. So red meat, meat products, drinks and foods containing added sugar, salt and alcoholic beverages. All those to be reduced if you want to stay healthy. And the low risk intake level comes from there. 
You can see it's 10 grams per day on average for women and 20 for men. And uh, then it says that the energy intake from alcohol should not account for more than 5% of the daily intake. And children, adolescents, and pregnant women and lactating women are recommended to abstain. And heavy drinking is to be avoided, defined as five to six drinks on a single occasion, and daily drinking to be avoided. So where does this come from? This comes from the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations, which is an example of of uh, a combination of Nordic joint work and of country-based fine-tuning. The Nordic recommendations for an optimal diet are developed under the aegis of the Nordic Council of Ministers, which is the official intergovernmental body for cooperation in the Nordic region. The uh, national recommendations that are given by the authorities in Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway and Sweden are all based on the joint Nordic recommendations, but they are fine-tuned to the national situation. So, for instance, uh, as regards alcohol, the, the recommendation in Finland was fine-tuned so that in the uh, Nordic recommendation there is no mention of heavy drinking or daily drinking, but in Finland those were considered necessary uh, additions. And uh, in the Nordic recommendation, lactating women are recommended to limit alcohol intake, whereas the recommendation in Finland is better abstain. So, just fine-tuning. But here comes the communication part. So, um, as I said, in, in response to a question from um, Dr. Zvian over there, about Finland not having done a very good job in disseminating information about the low-risk drinking guidelines. The Institute of National, um, for National, National Institute for Health and Welfare uh, decided to do better and um, put together all the advice to reduce risk from drinking alcohol in, in one place. Because the Institute is a very big um, organization with different departments and sometimes people in different departments are looking, different units are looking at their own topic from their own angle. They are providing recommendations. For instance, the pregnancy-oriented people give recommendation on alcohol during pregnancy and the accident prevention people give a recommendation to reduce risk of accidents. And these are kind of spread around. So what we did was that we followed the example of Switzerland and we put them all uh, in, in, in one fact sheet. So to say, it looks like this. I have a few samples if you're interested in the Finnish language. So um, this is a standard format for information and action uh, from the National Institute. So. Um, we combined in here the low risk, the moderate risk, the high risk information, as well as specific messages that had all been presented someplace. They all existed, but we put them in same same place. So there's a message about drinking to drunkenness to be avoided. Young people, older people, pregnancy, lactation, weight management, use of medications, risk of interaction, um, mental health disorders, road traffic, and uh, work. So, uh, um, the, um, the, um, the format is called Information and Action, and because of that, um, colleagues with my institute thought it important that the definitions of risk levels were also accompanied by advice for action. So, for each risk topic, there's also a one-liner saying what's best to do. And uh, we did change the term no likely risk. I realized when I was listening to Jan's presentation, uh, when he mentioned that in Switzerland they have to do everything in three languages. Don't you have four languages? Yes, but the fourth is uh, less than one percent. Okay. Okay. But the thing is that, that words do not always have equivalents in other 
languages. So for instance, in Finland, it's very difficult to, to find a translation for low risk. The, the best translation that we have is kind of minor risk. It's not really low risk. We don't, we, we, it, it sounds clumsy if we try to say low risk in Finland. So that might be maybe one reason why the doctors decided to say no likely risk. But for a layman, no likely risk is the same as probably safe. We don't want to say probably safe, so we say low risk, although it sounds minor risk, because we can't say low risk. So that's it. Thank you. Well, we can say low risk, but it doesn't sound good. <laughs> No question for Mariatta. <laughs> Nothing more? It's okay. Well, this was an example of contamination within the joint action, us following the Swiss model, multi component message. Yeah. Multi component message. Guidelines. Yes. Oh, Marietta, what, uh, I should know the answer to this, but uh, were the limits the same as for the Danish low and high risk? Mm, the Danish limit for um, kick, kick, Denmark, seven drinks per week, is that men or women? That's women. That's women. 14 for men, so it's the same. The same, exactly the same. limits as and, uh, uh, for yeah. Denmark. I and think the, the mic is the, not on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And the, the standard drink in Denmark and Finland is 12 grams in both. Yeah. So we're quite close. Thank you, Marietta. We are ahead of time. Okay, yeah. So let's proceed. Um, sorry. Yeah? Uh, take the mic, please. Uh, you are saying about low risk, probably no health harm if this level is not exceeded. And uh, in Denmark, we say that any alcohol use uh, carries a risk. Uh, you know, it gives you quite another feeling to say, well, this is probably safe. Uh, or if you state that as long as alcohol is a carcinogen, uh, any alcohol use carries a risk. I think it's a very different way to, to yeah. say it. Yeah. Um, we, we presented the uh, three um, risk levels as they were in the current care guidelines, because the doctors are the authority on this. But here, we added information. You see, we have squeezed in a lot of information in this fact sheet. So there is a message about, about positive health effects as well. And there is a message about, which says that even a small amount of alcohol consumption increases the risk of uh, of cancer in the in the thing yeah. from the yeah. larynx yeah. to bowel <laughs> and uh, and the liver and here comes again and the, the bowel and yeah many bowels lots of those and, ca and breast cancer so there is a list of cancers and it says that even small amount of alcohol consumption increases risk and as regards uh, the positive effects it says that that a, a small amount of alcohol consumption may reduce the risk of diabetes and coronary heart disease uh, in people who are past the middle age. And a healthy diet and uh, exercise are the primary ways to reduce uh, diseases. Yeah. But it, and that's obviously correct, but it's just if you have a one-liner, it's very 
uh, important if you have this one-liner or you have the Danish one-liner, <laughs> I think. So, yeah, words can do a lot of things in people's minds. Well, maybe in the next revision. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there's one important issue uh, from a pragmatic point touched here. Uh, I mean, that there's this notion to put everything as low as possible. Uh, and in a society where everybody drinks and many people drink much, uh, you always have to consider that it's not important to uh, convince a group of uh, missionary teetotalers, but the main society and especially those that drink too much. And so we have always to be very careful. I mean, if you say there's no risk with anything, I mean, nothing is safe. It could be that the water in Helsinki is not safe. You cannot prove it. Uh, until you prove it, you shouldn't drink it would be a stupid message. We have to be realistic and there's a pragmatic and not only an ideological point in it. Pragmatic is that we don't want to divide the society into teetotalers and drinkers, but that we want to convince a majority and then we have to be realistic. And I have the feeling sometimes it moves in a very unrealistic direction. Thank you. Okay. Ah. Yes. Okay. Thanks. I'm not sure it's quite correct to talk about societies where everybody drinks because I admit that Finns are great drinkers, but still, I think that we have some 10% uh, abstainers in the population. So, 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 so it's 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 a relative thing, and uh, and um, I quite agree that uh, the messages that are being sent to the population need to make sense, and quite often. Uh, the warnings about alcohol-related health risks and the guidelines to reduce risks are ridiculed, and in particular by the media. For instance, in the United States, when the uh, government agency, whose name I have forgotten, uh, a couple of weeks ago um, issued some guidance on, on uh, alcohol and uh, pregnancy, and they they um, pointed out that a lot of the pregnancies are unplanned and they said that women who are pregnant or who might be pregnant should avoid drinking. That was turned around in the media saying that the agency is requiring that women in the fertile age do not drink alcohol at all. So, I mean, that's the, that's the other way how the message can go badly wrong. It was not the, the message sent by the agency and I think it was quite sensible to inform young people who might be pregnant about this risk, but that's how it turned out. Thank you very much. Uh, personally, I favor the, the Danish and the Finnish approach of having two different um, levels of risk exactly for the reason that you point out that there are two different purposes and two, if you develop a guideline thinking of the high risk consumers which was the case in Finland that we only had that that guideline uh, and it was 24 drinks for men um, and and people interpreted it that it's safe for them to drink tw more than 20 drinks a week and they wonder what like I think it's quite high, but they say it's, they interpret it, it that it's safe. Uh, and uh, that's ridiculous <laughs> also. So uh, I think it's a, to me it seems like a relatively good solution to have two different limits for, to solve this problem. But um, I remember when we started this whole uh, project, there were some informal discussions and um, there were also people who said that, oh no, that would be just a complete mess, but then perhaps, I don't know if there are people in this room who think that way. It would be uh, nice to hear um, the, the cons, the, the bad sides in, that they see having these two different limits. 
Yes, if, if I can, uh, uh, I, I think that uh, we have uh, even uh, uh, to, uh, let's say, to, to, to compromise between us. I remember uh, uh, our last uh, course on uh, brief intervention and early identification that we made for uh, the Umbria region. And you know that in Italy, Umbria is a region where uh, I mean, there is a, a, a good production of wine. Uh, so we made this course for all general practitioners of the region. So they organized two days of course where all general practitioners, we meet them in, different, in three different places. And then we found out that according to our uh, guideline, uh, not more than one for human, the new one guideline, and not more than two, most of attendees, general practitioners, were uh, risky drinkers, so, and without any uh, awareness about that. So this is, uh, I think, uh, one of the reasons why we are working uh, with this, and we are even uh, seeing that uh, even if there is a, an ongoing project, we are still uh, dealing uh, at national level uh, with different uh, regulation and different, uh, and now so not, of, not a, a very often, the new guideline will, let's say, will meet uh, what uh, we are going to do now. But most probably, as Mariatta say, <laughs> we hope that it will be uh, better in, in the next future. Claude Rivière. Um, I don't know how to say this. Uh, is there a risk for the woman uh, who is, or for the conception, if the woman is drinking before the conception? And the second question is, is there, can the man or the husband, the man have a role in this, if he is drinking on the conception? I, mean, I don't know. Yes, Mariatta, yes. Somebody has to answer if there are no medical specialists here. But, uh, um, yeah, I think that the message in Finland is that uh, heavy drinking reduces the ability to procreate both for men and for women. And then um, later on, when the baby is born, in Finland, we have this system of, uh, what's it called, mother and baby clinics or something like that. Well, anyway, the idea is that both parents visit those clinics and they have this system that they, they present the audit test. The 10 questions that I have distributed here in this room it's the WHO developed audit test. They present the audit test to both parents before uh, the baby is born to check their alcohol consumption uh, patterns and possible harm and provide advice as appropriate. And they do that uh, after the baby is born and then again in two year checkup. And it's done for both the, the mother and the father if they're present. As far as I remember, uh, uh, most of the study are concentrated uh, uh, to the pregnant woman, but there are some study even for the, for the partner. And uh, as uh, uh, recently we are focusing, uh, there are a focus on, uh, but I don't remember uh, the, the authors, uh, that uh, they are focusing on the involvement of relative uh, helping uh, the pregnant woman to, to, to stop uh, drinking during pregnancy. They, they saw that uh, if you are going to, to involve the partner, uh, uh, let's say it, it, it will be more easy for the woman to stop to drink. But I, I don't know exactly, I mean, I, I did not focus perfectly on pregnant woman. Any further questions or comments? If not, we are um, moving to our next presentation and next uh, presenter.